Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Itai. I'm the head of uh, Luminous Vision. Uh, glad you have uh, the chance to join us. Uh, we have with us Dr. Epstein today, and we're going to talk about Optima IPL. Uh, Dr. Epstein needs no introduction, but still, for those of you who do not know him, if there are anyone uh, on the line like that, Dr. Epstein received his uh, Optometry degree from the State of University uh, of New York, State of College of Optometry, where he was also the college's first resident in ocular disease. Uh, you know, sought after speaker, he has presented more than 1,200 lectures on a variety of topics nationally and in more than 50 countries around the globe. Dr. Epstein has been working for with Luminis for about almost two years now and has been using the Optima IPL for the past two years. Thank you for thank you, Dr. Epstein, for joining us. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Itai, and uh, good morning, good afternoon. I guess not morning anymore, good afternoon, although <laughs> the way things are going these days, uh, morning just blends into afternoon, blends into evening. Anyway, I hope everyone's doing well and uh, <clears throat> as well as can be expected. Uh, definitely uh, an unprecedented and uh, uh, unusual time in our history. But uh, the great thing is we've uh, come together, and I think we're going to exit this at some point, hopefully stronger uh, than ever as a, as a profession. Uh, I know it's difficult uh, for some people, especially in the uh, more affected areas, but uh, uh, I know we will get through this. Um, and. Um, uh, hopefully this uh, presentation will be helpful for those of you who are interested uh, in dry eye and in expanding your practice. Uh, one of the key uh, elements here, and I think uh, it's an important uh, uh, point uh, to discuss, is that uh, one of the things that uh, I think is clearly apparent from this outbreak is the vulnerability of traditional refractive optometry. It uh, was the first thing to go. Uh, today, very few of us are seeing routine uh, refractive patients. Uh, the practices that remain open, including ours, uh, are, at least in our case, only for patients uh, who have uh, emergencies uh, in medical uh, eye care uh, uh, areas. Uh, and we're seeing a fair number, uh, you know, where we're weathering the storm as best as can be expected. Uh, but incorporating dry eye into your practice, in particular uh, procedures, I think is extremely important uh, for uh, the future uh, pro progress of our profession and, in fact, maybe even its survival. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we um, got involved uh, about a year and a half, almost two years ago, uh, with IPL. My practice uh, in Phoenix uh, has been limited only to dry eye since its inception. I'm part of a, a larger group called Phoenix Eye Care, originally opened just with uh, my wife. Uh, the conception, the idea was to um, have a practice that incorporated a, essentially a standalone uh, dry eye uh, service within a larger primary care practice, medically focused. You know, probably at this point about 80 percent. Well, at this point, 100 percent of our practice is medical, but uh, under normal circumstances, it's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent is medical uh, eye care. And uh, I very quickly. Uh, started cutting uh, routine exams after opening. Of course, when we first started, I had to see uh, some routine patients. Uh, but at this point, I only see dry eye. And in fact, our young associate that we've added uh, last year um, also sees a fair number of dry eye patients. And uh, as I'll share with you, uh, Optima IPL uh, technology is a significant part of it. Uh, so just, uh, again, this isn't the CE program, but um, you know, I tend to be as transparent as I can be. Uh, those of you who know me know that I pretty much say exactly what I think, uh, regardless of consequences, uh, sometimes, uh, and uh, or actually very often. Uh, and uh, these are companies that have generally re sponsored uh, research or sponsored talks or things of that sort. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to say today actually reflects my own opinions, uh, and uh, you can kind of take that to the bank. Uh, 
So why dry eye? Well, I kind of got into it a second ago. Uh, for us, I think it's an imperative. Uh, I think dry eye is the low hanging fruit on the tree of medical optometry. Uh, the reason why is we're seeing increases in prevalence, the dramatic increases, so rapid and so broad that the current literature doesn't reflect it. You know, a lot of the data that you see from the Beaver Dam study and things of that sort really are, are out of date almost as soon as they're published. We're seeing a much younger demographic. We're seeing uh, people who are much uh, more significantly affected. It impedes normal function. It interferes with work. It interferes with life. Uh, we have patients uh, you know, who literally have their lives completely turned upside down. Their entire family structures are uh, heavily uh, impacted by the severity of their problems. And, uh, you know, the data here, uh, again, I think underestimates it. 34 million patients, uh, I think, is is an underestimation. I think we're seeing 34 million patients today, and we'll see even more, uh, you know, as, as time goes on. Uh, hopefully, life expectancy won't be impacted by uh, uh, the COVID virus, but we are seeing increases in life expectancy. We're seeing patients that are undergoing more procedures. They've gotten much better, no doubt but we still see significant dry eye issues from them. Uh, we are seeing significant uh, dysfunction of meibomian glands because of increased screen time, changes in diet. Uh, patients are much more aware. The internet uh, has uh, brought patients in that I think would have sil silently suffered for a long time. And many of us have incorporated advanced diagnostic uh, technology, you know, uh, mybography uh, and so on. So uh, we're seeing a significant number of patients in your office today, uh, if you're not uh, practicing dry eye in a, in a fairly comprehensive manner, you're missing out on a lot of patient need that could make a big difference uh, to your overall practice success uh, and uh, bottom line. And you can see this in this statistic very clearly. Uh, most patients are not satisfied. In fact, we thrive on uh, patient dissatisfaction. Many of our patients have seen three or four other doctors, uh, sometimes very bright doctors, sometimes good friends, uh, sometimes referred, sometimes, uh, in fact, more often than not, finding their way uh, to our office on their own. Uh, and uh, it really reflects just how uh, difficult it is to manage these patients if you're not incorporating some of the more modern thinking and technology. I think one of the biggest issues we have, and that's kind of a, a big thing with me, is that there's a massive amount of noise. We've over-confused this subject area. Uh, so you, you think it may be evaporative stress, or it may be uh, aqueous deficient, or evaporative dry eye, or it may be uh, inflammatory, or it may be osmolarity as a driver, or it may, you know, you name the underlying cause. The bottom line is it's relatively straightforward and simple, uh, and the current dues definition really, uh, I think, hits the nail right on the head by targeting homeostasis and this inability to maintain homeostasis. And what homeostasis uh, relates to is the need for the ocular surface to maintain function and balance despite whatever challenges the external environment throws at it. And patients who have quote-unquote dry eye or essentially dysfunctional uh, tears or dysfunctional ocular surface uh, are patients who are not able to maintain homeostasis for any number of reasons. Uh, sometimes they, there are, is an inflammatory component, but more often than not, the reason why is meibomian gland dysfunction and failure to maintain a sufficient lipid layer thickness and lipid layer cohesivity to create a structural protective element. So a lot of words, uh, you know, summed up very, very nicely in this definition. You know, dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface. It starts getting a little scary and then brings it back home, a loss of homeostasis of the tear film accompanied by tear film instability. Tear film instability is, is what drives a lot of the patient misery and certainly something that we can measure using non-invasive breakup time or we can measure it using fluorescein breakup time to some extent, although the two are quite different. Hyperosmolarity to me is something that occurs naturally when you have a deficient tear reservoir. So in other words, there's less dilutant, um, you know, uh, so it's uh, essentially uh, a lack of <clears throat> solute to solvent 
uh, so or excessive solute compared to solvent, I should say. Uh, ocular surface inflammation occurs as part of the attempt at maintaining homeostasis fairly early on and needs to be managed. Um, IPL does manage that at some level. We'll talk about that. And certainly neurosensory abnormalities uh, we recognize as playing a significant role because all of this is controlled centrally. So I think that's very, very important to keep in mind. <clears throat> you may be familiar with this. You may have seen it. I think it's a very important simplified approach to understanding the uh, cyclic nature of dry eye and how this spirals out of control. This is from Bourgeois, Christophe Bourgeois's uh, proposed vicious circle of the pathology of dry eye disease. Um, and he has a, an update of this as well. Uh, and if you notice, again, right at the very center of it, a primary driver is meibomian gland dysfunction and some of the other uh, issues associated with it, uh, overpopulation of uh, staph bacteria, production of uh, lipase, uh, esterases, which degrade the lipid layer of the tear film, causing tear film instability. So this drives a lot of it, but all of this is part of an overarching a centrally controlled process intended to maintain function, but because of modern times and some of the stressors and challenges that we have, uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing maintenance of function, we're seeing dysfunction. In fact, the first thing I do when a patient comes in and uh, I put up some of the data we have, uh, I obviously talk to them and try to understand exactly what's going on, but I also need to educate them. And I start by saying, I know Mrs. Smith, uh, you uh, were sent here or you came here because you believe you have dry eye, but here's your eye. You can see it's quite wet. Your eyes aren't dry. It's not that you're not making enough tears. It's that your tears are not working properly. And that begs the question, what is it that tears do? Tears actually create a perfectly smooth refractive surface. The, the initial the design of the system was to allow us to see wells, to avoid predators and to forage for food. Uh, but more importantly for you right now is it's not doing its job in protecting the surface. The lipid layer is critically important because it creates a cohesive outer barrier. In fact, it's very similar uh, to the role that the skin plays, except the skin is tissue uh, and the tear film is obviously liquid, but it's not a simple liquid. Uh, even the lipid layer is made up of you know dozens, if not hundreds of different lipid species and normal functioning glands produce uh, the uh, proper ratios of the different species of lipids to create this cohesive outer barrier. Uh, the outermost barrier is made up of nonpolar lipids, uh, which create a shield, almost a cellophane or saran wrap shield over the surface. And if there's sufficient lipid and it remains intact, the eye is protected regardless of the external environment, regardless of the challenges uh, that uh, may, uh, may be presented with. Uh, and the underlying lipid layer is made up of phospholipids or, or uh, polar lipids. Polar lipids essentially look like lipid on one end of the molecule and water on the other. And if you think about that a little bit, you realize lipid sticks to lipid, that's hydrophobic bonding, and water sticks to water, hydrophilic bonding, two very strong uh, forces. Uh, and it creates a glue-like uh, um, stickiness to the lipid layer, which holds it in place, which is why surface tension is one of the things that allows for protection of the ocular surface. Now, all this is great, but the most important part of it is being able to explain it to patients in a way that they understand. So I always start off by saying, you know, you don't have dry eye, uh, it's that your tears aren't functioning, and uh, there's two different types of tears, and you know, because we have to talk about tears if you're talking about uh, what the patient thought was dry eye, and I talk about reflex tears and explain that it's a brilliant uh, engineered system to wash things away. You know, think of your ancestors. We didn't have nail clippers. We didn't have hand washing, uh, you know, facilities. You couldn't uh, remove a piece of volcanic ash from your eye without scratching your cornea, and you'd lose the eye, and that would be the end. And you know, you could survive that. So we were built with this incredible ability to wash things away. In fact, we emulate that, in, you know, in, in modern times with eye wash stations. But the more important tears are the basal tears, and the basal tears uh, are constantly produced much, much more complex from an engineering point of view and structural in nature. The easiest way to think of them is to think of a structure you're familiar with, like a house. So there's a foundation, an underlying layer that allows the tears to adhere to the surface of the eye, just like a foundation allows the building to remain stable and intact regardless of external forces, wind and, and so on. 
uh, and an outermost layer like a roof, but this is made up of the lipids that you know we talked about before, uh, and it creates a, uh, a, a complete separation between the outer environment uh, and the inner environment of the tears and the ocular surface. Uh, and tear stability uh, is a key for most patients to maintaining function and comfort. So the literature says that uh, my bombing gland dysfunction amounts to uh, 86%. This is the LEM study that you may be familiar with. Uh, and I think the number is off uh, by a, an order of magnitude or more. In fact, I was uh, talking to Donald Korb a couple weeks ago and I said, Donald, I think it's not 86%. Uh, I think it's 99.86%, and he laughed and he said he agreed. Um, the overwhelming majority of patients, even the ones who have Sjogren's uh, disease, the ones who have uh, inflammatory eye disease, uh, dry eye disease like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, uh, uh, and so on, all of those patients have a significant comorbidity of meibomian gland dysfunction. Uh, and if you have a patient who's aqueous deficient because of underlying disease, it's very difficult to manage that and supplement that, but you can stabilize the tear film uh, by increasing and improving the quality uh, and cohesivity of the outer lipid layer. That's really the, the primary approach that we use, and we have dramatic success. Uh, we've had phenomenally good results in, in approaching it from that perspective. Uh, so yeah, I know 14% aqueous deficient, but even patients that uh, have uh, normal lipid layers can be aqueous deficient, and patients who have abnormal aqueous deficiency can have abnormal lipid layers. So you know, it's a part of a continuum now, we think of meibomian gland dysfunction uh, as, um, you know, related to uh, skin conditions, and indeed it is. And in fact, as I've embraced uh, IPL as a therapeutic option, I've come to realize that a significant percentage of the patients that I see actually have rosacea. In fact, rosacea may be the most underestimated, most ubiquitous disease that we have passing through our offices, often without mention. And it is an poorly understood inflammatory disease of the sebaceous glands of the skin. Yes, I know you're immediately saying it's uh, staph uh, associated or it's demodex associated, and uh, that may well be true and those things are manageable, uh, but remember that the sebaceous glands of the skin and the meibomian glands of the lids are kissing cousins. You know, they're both derived from similar tissue uh, and uh, both suffer from the same issues when it comes to inflammation, except it's more visible and more apparent to the patient when they're talking about the dermatologic and cutaneous issues. Now, what's great about that is that um, the treatment that we use for managing the eye also has uh, secondary benefits for the skin. So even if you're in a state like Arizona where we cannot treat the aesthetics, uh, the patients still benefit uh, at some level. Uh, and a lot of the work, the early work on uh, the function of IPL uh, was uh, done in the dermatology realm. And uh, reading some of those literature uh, can be very, very useful. So Luminous um, has been around for uh, a good number of years. You can see uh, they started in 1970. Uh, it's uh, an Israeli company that makes over-engineered state-of-the-art technology uh, that uh, is just incredible. I have been literally blown away with it. Uh, it wasn't something that I immediately adopted. I was concerned about the medical legal consequences. It wasn't approved by our board. Uh, I went to the board and I you know, said, hey, uh, we got like a, a, an opinion on this. And they said, when there's an issue, we'll give an opinion. And I said, that is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, we went back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And then finally, they approved it uh, for dry eye, which makes sense because it's been proven to be extremely beneficial uh, for dry eye. So Luminous uh, in 1970 uh, came up with the first uh, argon photocoagulator, SLT, in 1995, uh, and uh, introduced the first IPL in 19. 97. IPL intense pulse light. Uh, I usually tell patients that intense pulse light is 
uh, a way of describing packets of energy that are incorporated within the light packets. Uh, and that's what essentially you're doing. You're applying energy to uh, the meibomian glands to change their function. Uh, in 2015, they introduced uh, the current generation, the sixth generation uh, of uh, uh, IPL, uh, the M22, which we have. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, an incredible uh, addition, which I'll talk about uh, in some detail. So what what makes this unique is that you're able to control a number of things. For example, you can control uh, energy, uh, you can control uh, the wavelength, uh, you can control the energy delivery by uh, controlling uh, the amount of energy given in uh, pulses, uh, which is extremely important because that is one way of delivering a significant amount of therapeutic energy without causing uh, significant damage. And that's uh, always a great concern. There are uh, devices that are out there that you can uh, pick up on eBay. Uh, you should also be getting the name of a defense lawyer at the same time uh, because they do cause significant burns. If you you know look at some of the adverse events, uh, it's very, very difficult. I would say you'd have to be uh, fairly uh, <laughs> I'm looking for the right word. Uh, you'd have to be not paying attention to actually cause damage with a luminous device. It re really is is fool foolproof in its uh, conception. Uh, and so essentially what this does is it takes a broad spectrum of light, gets rid of uh, the damaging uh, aspects of light energy, uh, the stuff that causes cancer and aging of the skin, uh, and allows the light energy to be in the, focused in a very narrow range. Uh, now, you know, in terms of using light energy, I often tell patients that, you know, light is extremely therapeutic. When you were a kid, if you grew up on, you know, uh, the coast or, or near the coast, uh, and, uh, you know, if you're a teenager and you had acne, uh, you know, you had a breakout and you had a big date coming, you'd head to the beach. So uh, you'd sit in the sun for a little bit and, you know, next day the acne would be basically gone. Uh, and it's the same basic concept. The sun actually has healing ability. You know, I, I don't want to get into the philosophical, you know, uh, or historical philosophical uh, discussion of, you know, sun worshiping and things of that sort. But the energy of the sun has been used for therapeutic uh, uh, purposes and this essentially harnesses that energy in in your hand it's the only technology that we have in our office that literally changes tissue function and structure that we can control uh, in our hands literally uh, held in our hands so um, what's interesting is that there's a lot of underlying science and more is being uncovered as we speak uh, in dermatology they talk about photobiomodulation uh, we talk about photomodulation in eye care and essentially what we're doing is we're changing uh, the activity of cellular components that um, uh, cause uh, or that promote normal function of glands. So we improve function. We also uh, get rid of demodex and bacterial overpopulation. Uh, IPL uh, devices are actually used to sterilize operating rooms. You know, obviously not the same type of IPL. You know, these are much broader, uh, more powerful units, but, uh, you know, the, the basic concept holds, uh, holds true. So all of the things that contribute to dry eye and meibomian gland dysfunction uh, are uh, treatable uh, with IPL, basically decreases the level of pro-inflammatory mediators, uh, it reduces osmolarity of the tear film to normal levels. Uh, um, Laura Perriman had a beautiful video of uh, what happens to demodex mites that are treated with IPL. They don't fare particularly well. Uh, and we've seen significant improvements in meibomian gland structure as well as function uh, in our own patient population. In fact, you can see significant improvement in uh, my bum uh, consistency immediately after treating patients in a majority of cases, sometimes shockingly so. So there's a lot of uh, uh, science behind this. Uh, this was originally discovered by uh, Rolando Toyos, uh, who practices in Memphis, uh, and uh, the Toyos approach, we use a modification of the Toyos approach. It uses the uh, facial pattern of, uh, of uh, treatment, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and uh, Steve Dell, and I'm sure you're familiar with Dell Computers. Well, Steve Dell is Michael Dell's brother. Uh, and uh, Steve Dell is a refraction, uh, refractive uh, corneal surgeon in uh, Austin. Uh, 
uh, and um, uh, he is particularly interested in IPL and has done a fair amount of research. This early study uh, shows, you know, significant improvement. And you can, you know, just look at the data, uh, and you can see, you know, how uh, effective this can be in managing these patients. Uh, from a personal perspective, uh, we've had overwhelming success, not every single patient, but the overwhelming majority of patients have had significant success. Um, some patients have literally set up a retreatment uh, uh, protocols for themselves. In other words, they come, you know, come back for follow-up, you know, as, which is typical for our practice, uh, and then say, when are we going to have another treatment? So, you know, the patients have, uh, you know, have done, uh, uh, I mean, so well that they literally want to return to it. Uh, we have a lot of uh, science in terms of the physiology of what happens, uh, looking at inflammatory markers and looking at gland morphology. Now, obviously, this is not something that you're going to see uh, using mybography. This is uh, confocal microscopy. But we do see improvements using mybography. We use uh, we have a uh, Oculus Keratograph 5M that I use a lot, and we also have a uh, lip of you too. Uh, and you can see improvement in gland structure. Again, you have to be a bit of an aficionado of mybography in order to, you know, see that. Sometimes it can be subtle, but we do see significant improvements. And for patients, it varies, but it typically occurs by the second or third treatment. Uh, some patients are a little bit more resistant and it takes longer, but we do see uh, overall uh, significant improvements in both signs and symptoms. And as you can see here, uh, the studies increase, uh, you know, steadily. We see more and more studies literally with each passing month internationally, you know, from across the U.S. and globally as well. Uh, people are recognizing this as a primary treatment for uh, managing meibomian gland dysfunction and, uh, and dry eye. Uh, as you can see, it goes on and on. So uh, this is uh, not uh, something that was, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a sideshow or an eccentric idea. Uh, Dues to recognize this IPL as a primary treatment of uh, meibomian gland dysfunction and associated dry eye. Um, you know, the, I find the Dues to, uh, you know, therapeutic algorithm to be overly complex. You know, we treat patients with a baseline approach, which includes a triglyceride-based omega-3 with a minimum of 3 to 1 EPA to DHA ratio. Uh, we treat them with hypochlorous acid applied to the lids twice a day. Uh, we, you know, sometimes use tears as a supplement. You know, I, I'll use whatever tears they're happiest with, or in the absence of a choice, uh, I'll use uh, Allergan's uh, Refresh Up to Mega 3, which I find to be quite good. Uh, and I mean, I can go on for about two hours if there's a significant amount of inflammation. Uh, we'll use uh, Zydra or, or Sequa, depending on the patient. Uh, and um, when patients get to a point where they're either severe or they're not improving at a level I want, I immediately think of what to choose, and we'll talk about how to make that choice. Do we use uh, IPL first, or we do use something else? And you'll notice, by the way, when you look here, there's a lot of your colleagues uh, that are uh, using IPL, that have adopted IPL across the country, uh, and many of them are recognizable faces. Uh, and by the way, Derek uh, works with Steve Dell. He was one of the authors on that on that uh, pivotal study. Uh, Dave Nelson in Wisconsin, an ex uh, past president of the AOA, uh, and uh, John McCall from Vision Source, Whitney Hauser, and uh, Selena McGee, Scott Schachter. I mean, it's literally uh, a who's who of people involved in uh, in, in dry eye. So the treatment process is simple, and I, and I want to go over this uh, with you, um, you know, just so you see how straightforward it is. Now, uh, a dry eye treatment in a dry eye only practice is not a 15-minute encounter or even a 30-minute encounter. It's typically a 45-minute encounter with me, uh, an additional time for testing of about 15, 20 minutes. So patients are told that they're going to spend more than an hour. The testing is charged as an additional fee. Uh, so patients expect to spend a lot of time. When we first started doing IPL, uh, we realized, uh, you know, that it wasn't going to be like a lip of low treatment, which is, you know, typically a half an hour slot uh, to get the patient prepared and get everything set. Uh, it's impossible because we started to do such an incredible volume. We went from, you know, basically nothing to now we're doing 20 to 30, even more treatments a week. Uh, and you cannot do that in a half an hour slot because, you know, you'll be there till, you know, midnight. So, 
we quickly realized that this had to be orchestrated very, very carefully. So uh, the patient is brought in. If it's a new patient, uh, we uh, do all of the preliminary work. We discuss uh, the informed consent, uh, risks, benefits, and so on. Uh, in addition, we uh, go over, uh, you know, testing for skin type. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the amount of energy applied depends upon their skin type, how dark their skin is. Some patients uh, um, who have darker skin, you can't even use IPL1, but for the majority of, of patients that we see, we can, but we have to adjust for that uh, and uh, make sure the patient uh, understands everything. The patient then receives patches. Uh, typically, we use an external patch, as you see here. Uh, the patient has gel applied, which is basically ultrasound gel. We use an aloe-based gel. Uh, this is all done by the tech before I walk in, I come in, uh, I review all of the uh, data that she's gathered, make sure the skin typing is accurate. We have a device that actually uh, measures skin typing. Uh, and uh, so that kind of double checks it. I double check all the settings that she's already put in to the device. I explain to the patient that I'm going to start on their left side, right by uh, the edge of their earlobe. I'm going to fire a test shot um, and uh, or a test pulse, as I usually say to the patient. Um, shot sounds a little too aggressive for many. Uh, and uh, then I wait to make sure they react well to it. And then I say, we'll just go from here. And the pattern that you see with what looks like little sticky, sticky notes uh, is what I use uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, pulses applied uh, in an ongoing basis. And the pulses are uh, energy and rest. In this case, a triple pulse, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And I'm still using four treatments separated by about four weeks. You can go anywhere from as little as two to as much as six, uh, but we typically go three to four weeks. Uh, with the IPL by Luminous, the M22, there's virtually no pain for the majority of patients. Uh, and it is uh, very much spa-like. It's not uncomfortable for the patient. I do not express afterwards. I find it unnecessary. Uh, if patients need expression, that's a whole other story. And then that's either lip of flow uh, or tear care. Uh, the way I think about this, and I think this is very important because it took me a long time to wrap my mind around which patient uh, was best for which procedure. Uh, basically, if a patient fails or I have not achieved the outcomes that I want, and, and I tell patients from the get-go, I am uh, tenacious, I don't give up, uh, and I'm focused on outcomes. If I don't achieve the outcome I want with the foundational therapies, the omega-3s and the hypochlorous acid and the simple things, which is a whole other lecture in and of itself, uh, which you can hear online. I have a number of lectures that go through my uh, protocol uh, that are available on OD Wire and uh, Jobson and so on. Uh, I do that freely, by the way, because I want you know my success to be everyone's success. Um, once I've gotten to the point where I'm not happy with the patient that has advanced disease or the patient is not happy, uh, then I suggest to the patient that a procedure may be the best choice. For some patients, probably about a third of them, that's something that I do right away. With IPL, I'm apt to do that uh, more often than not right from the get-go, which is uh, something that's a change from my normal standard operating procedure uh, prior to incorporating IPL. Uh, and I should add, by the way, the reason why I was hesitant, uh, aside from the medical legal thing, is that I just wasn't 100% sure of the efficacy of it. And it was really Laura Perriman, uh, who was very scientific uh, in her approach to it, uh, that finally made a gel. And in fact, I think, if anything, as I look back, underestimated the efficacy of it. So uh, I, once we decide that we're going to go with uh, a, a therapeutic option, a procedural option, uh, and the procedures are very important uh, for optometry. It's the future for optometry, especially medical optometry. I break it down into what the problem uh, is, what is the underlying cause of the problem. So if the patient uh, is not producing a lot of lipid, now you can assess that by using diagnostic expression, or even better, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, by using a lip of you, if you happen to have one, or lip of you too. Um, you can actually assess the thickness of the lipid layer and the quality of the lipid, because, you know, as I said before, I think uh, the my bone glands produce this complex of uh, rich lipids, you know, multiple species, hundreds of different species, polar and non-polar lipids. Uh, and uh, if the lipids are functioning perfectly, 
perfectly, you'll end up with a coherent, almost outer cellophane-like layer that protects against evaporation and stabilizes the tear foam. Even if you're making a ton of lipid and the lipid isn't high quality and it's not coherent, uh, you can end up with an unstable tear foam. So if I see uh, relatively decent quality lipid, but not enough, then and the glands are clearly obstructed, then I use a procedure that uh, removes the obstruction. So I'll use something like a lip of well for the majority of patients or patients who have small apertures uh, or have other issues, I'll use uh, tear care. So, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're going to use, tear care, uh, Ilux, uh, lip of well. Again, I love lip of well. I've been using it for years, tremendous success with it, uh, and my tech does it. So I have relatively little involvement with it other than to check uh, after uh, and to recommend it. So recommend it and make sure that uh, uh, everything was done well uh, before the patient leaves. But a significant patient, perhaps the majority of patients, actually produce a reasonable amount of lipid, sometimes less than optimal, but the lipid is abnormal. And you can see it's gunky, it still comes out. Uh, when you'll, you'll see in a second what it looks like on interferometry. Those are patients who do really well with IPL. So IPL we're doing probably, I would say, not quite 10 to 1. Uh, but uh, not insignificant uh, predisposition uh, towards doing IPL. So if you look at, at these uh, um, interferometry patterns, this is from a lip of you too, uh, and uh, look at the upper left-hand corner, you can see that this is an eye uh, that has a fairly uh, uh, thick lipid layer, but look at how miserable uh, that lipid layer is in terms of you know, cohesivity. It's just incoherent, it's all over the place. Uh, sometimes you see those little dots you can see on the image uh, of that upper image, you know, to the uh, to the right of the first one. Uh, the lower uh, image on the left is more typical, where you see these like commas or waves, uh, and the and the lipid doesn't uh, create a cohesive barrier. And again, uh, as I think I said before, uh, this is my third webinar today, so <laughs> forgive me if I if I'm a little a little uh, confused as to what I said when. But uh, if uh, you know, you look at what the lipid layer does, it does the same thing to the skin does. It basically creates a cohesive barrier to protect us from the outside environment. You know, again, skin tissue, uh, uh, lipid layer, and, and tear film liquid, but the same intent is there. Now, if you look at uh, the upper right-hand image, you can see it's relatively homogeneous. It's almost a straight line, but it's way low, like maybe a quarter of normal maybe a little bit higher than that. Uh, and the other one, uh, one over, you know, on the right of the right, uh, it's still, you know, relatively cohesive. Same thing for the others. The, the one with the question mark is unquestionable. And, you know, that leads to the number of patients that really are candidates for both. Uh, someone asked me uh, last webinar, which I do first, you know, and uh, he actually sequenced the lip of flow in between uh, doing IPL. I don't. I do uh, typically four. I don't know that patients necessarily need four. Some patients need only three. Some patients need five. If a patient needs an extra IPL, I just do it. Uh, but I'm kind of rethinking that constantly. And we have a growing number of patients that have both uh, expression as well as IPL. But this hopefully gave you some insight into what the uh, criteria is for choosing which. Uh, and I will tell you that satisfaction overall with IPL, especially with the um, you know, cutaneous benefits uh, has been absolutely amazing. I mean, just, you know, patients are happier uh, than I can even describe and refer other patients. So it's actually built our practice nicely. So the question is why luminous? And, uh, you know, this is something I've discussed with luminous. I, I actually love this company. I mean, this company has been phenomenal with support. Uh, the technology is just you know, over-engineered. Um, you know, I started my career heading towards engineering, and I approach dry eye as an engineer would. At least I like to think I do. Uh, I look at this as a structural problem that needs to be uh, figured out, uh, and the engineering behind the luminous is just over-engineered. You know, I talked about uh, triple pulse before. Uh, oh, this is nice. Actually, you can actually see the procedure being done. You know, it's funny, if you watch me do it, this is not me doing it, uh, but I am more like bop, 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 which probably makes some of the luminous folks go, eh, uh, but, 
you know, I, I just get through it very, very quickly. We don't use quite that much gel, but you see for the patient, it's not uncomfortable at all. You know, it's a relatively straightforward thing. And again, remember that you're applying a significant amount of energy uh, in a very controlled fashion that's calibrated for specific absorption by the skin in a way that transits up to the meibomian glands, changes meibomian gland function and structure. Uh, the engineering includes this chiller tip, so this is kept cool to counter the heating effects of this. So you're de delivering a lot of energy with a lot of, without a lot of discomfort, uh, and you're controlling the fluence, which is the overall energy, the amount of pulses, as well as the wavelength through cutoff filters. So actually very straightforward and, 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 and simple. Now the systems I referred to earlier, and I said, you know, be cautious and, and get the name of a defense attorney. Uh, look at the pattern, the wave pattern, uh, and you can see this very sharp spike. So even though an average amount of energy that's reasonably controlled is being delivered, it's not homogeneous. So you end up with these really high spikes. And these are the patients that end up with burns. Uh, and on the other hand, if you look at uh, luminous and you know the green square you can see it's a flat curve it's square it's square waves so this generates precise square waves precise timing and if you sum all of the pulses together and for dry eye we use a triple pulse you end up with a sum total of energy delivered in smaller increments which causes less potential damage and discomfort so uh, it, just absolutely brilliant engineering. And, and, you know, it's the kind of instrument that you look at and you go, I mean, uh, you know, there are some instruments I really love, you know, like I think of them as the Porsche, you know, of the instrument world. Uh, Luminous is one of them. Uh, the uh, Karatograph 5M, another beautifully designed uh, instrument. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is great. I mean, you know, I'm very comfortable with it. I'm very confident. And I think anyone who approaches this without being n nervous initially, I think is, is foolish. I think you're handling a lot of energy. You have to be very careful. I tell patients, I treat it like I'm flying a plane. You know, I walk around the wings. I make sure everything is working. You know, I double check all the, you know, readings. Uh, I want to make sure, uh, you know, I, I have enough uh, fuel to get uh, there and back. Uh, I want to make sure that the amount of energy is the amount of energy I intend. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a, a device that gives you a tremendous amount of feedback uh, and uh, tells you exactly what you need to do. Uh, you know, in terms of investment, we paid it back, I'd say, within three months. Uh, the handpiece lasts uh, for 100,000 pulses, which will give you a fair amount of use, uh, and then is a replaceable uh, replaceable element in the system. Uh, and uh, what's nice is all of these things are preset. You can adjust them as you become more experienced. Uh, and also uh, it's upgradable, which is really neat. And uh, there's no consumable. So you're not throwing away uh, activators or disposables or you know whatever it is. Uh, so the cost of implementation is actually controlled. So that is pretty much uh, nope, actually, energy levels decrease with use. Okay, actually, that's you're talking about first level systems. Um, oh, actually, I didn't even realize that. This slide kind of popped in and I didn't even realize it was here. Um, Oh, yeah. Actually, I have a lot of friends in Australia, and uh, one of my friends told me, and I don't remember the name of the device, uh, that a distributor came in uh, selling this uh, IPL device at a relatively low cost and lasted nine months and then disappeared. And when the devices started breaking, there was no one there to service it. So there was a significant uproar uh, down, uh, down there. Uh, as this notes, you can get them on eBay. You can also get uh, you can also get lasers that will blow holes in uh, in walls on eBay. Uh, you have to be somewhat uh, careful about that. Uh, so anyway, um, um, I think I'll talk a little bit about how I uh, did this um, um, in terms of my initial. Uh, well, actually, you know, I, I really didn't, uh, actually, you know, so, yeah, actually, in fact, I think this is my, this is actually my my own slide, but I forgot what was in here because I put some other slides in, so I apologize for that. So let, let me tell you about how easy this is uh, to implement. So uh, we've been doing Lipiflow from the beginning, so we've been doing Lipiflow since the practice opened. Uh, Lipiflow is sometimes difficult to sell, especially in the early days when it was uh, considerably more expensive, uh, and uh, I... 
um, realized fairly early that I wasn't good at selling procedures. Uh, I was with some patients. I would say, you know, Mrs. Smith, uh, you need this procedure and, and uh, you know, and it costs this amount and, and, you know, I'd like to schedule it. But I found that for some patients, when I sensed any resistance, it was much easier to do uh, the surgical coordinator or the LASIK closer approach. I had my tech come in and I had prepared her, you know, to do this. Uh, and I say, I'm going to have Donna explain this procedure. I'd like to do this. And I think it'll make more sense. So if she explains it, I would leave. She'd come in and she would explain, you know, what Lipoflow was for the patient. And, uh, and uh, you know, they had, I had already, you know, discussed what it did uh, in terms of the, the technology and why I wanted to do it. But she would talk about the mechanics of doing it and so on. And then she would say, when would you like to make the appointment? And nine out of 10 patients would make the appointment. Um, with, uh, the IPL system, I realized that this was another potentially complex thing until I started talking to the patients. And then I realized that the best part of it was explaining how well it worked uh, and the history of it in terms of dermatology and the cutaneous benefits. Uh, and of course, in Arizona, the board was very clear that we're not uh, allowed to do aesthetic treatments, that we're doing dry eye treatments. But the patient uh, was able to connect the dots uh, and quickly realize that going through uh, the cheeks to get to the meibomian glands would potentially have aesthetic benefits as a collateral uh, benefit, if you will. Uh, and many of the patients said, okay, when can I sign up? So I find that it's easy for me to just say, hey, I want to do IPL uh, and uh, I'd like to schedule it. And the patients just go uh, right along with it. And patients, um, you know, kind of get it. They're familiar with IPL. No one had ever heard of Lipoflow unless they're a serious dry eye patient. But many of the patients in uh, in our area are familiar with IPL because of its aesthetic benefits. And in fact, I usually bring up the subject by saying, you know, it's been used in dermatology, as I said before, you know, for a long time for photo facials and things of that sort. Uh, in terms of scheduling, we schedule well, four appointments from the get-go, we bundle uh, the procedures. Uh, each procedure would be more expensive individually. We bundle them together as a package of four. As I said before, I do a fifth if necessary without additional charge. We're thinking about uh, sw switching to three uh, treatments uh, and then coming up with maybe charging them four and then doing five if necessary and doing only three and not talking about the number of treatments, but rather the outcome. Uh, but that's still in its uh, early stages. Uh, protocol is relatively state, straightforward. I use the Toyos approach, which is uh, tragus to tragus, earlobe to earlobe, uh, over the cheeks, over the nose, and down the other side. Uh, in males uh, whose uh, sideburns I want to protect, which is basically all males, uh, I avoid the sideburn area. And in those cases, I sometimes will do additional forehead treatments. If someone has a very uh, small face and I'm not getting as much energy as I want, I'll sometimes will do forehead. Uh, you know, patients are gelled before treatment. Uh, the technician cleans off the gel and removes the patches. And so it's kind of a ballet. Uh, aftercare, every patient leaves with a uh, sunblock. Uh, and told to use the sunblock for the duration of the treatment and several weeks after. Um, uh, let's see, we have had absolutely, other than mild sunburn-like symptoms in a small, small percentage of patients, we've had no big issues. Uh, I tell uh, patients to use, oh, what's that stuff to use for baby, uh, uh, baby diaper rash? Um, uh, you can pick it up at any pharmacy. Um, and I'm blocking on the name, but I tell them if they need to, they can use that if their skin feels rough or, or raw. But uh, I think we've had one person use it. I have cool packs uh, in the office. We've used them twice. Uh, in terms of measuring results, uh, we have the patient come back in six weeks uh, and after the last treatment. Uh, and we do a complete workup, including mybography, lip and layer thickness, uh, non-invasive breakup time, lacrimal uh, height, uh, tear meniscus height, uh, and so on. Uh, and we've seen dramatic improvements in virtually all patients. Uh, in terms of uh, OSDI or speed, we use speed. Uh, uh, we've seen significant, significant improvements. And some patients describe it as life-changing. In fact, many patients describe it as life-changing. And as I mentioned before, in some cases, the cutaneous, the dermatologic or aesthetic benefits are stunning. You know, patients with deep uh, pock marks from acne, 
gone literally gone by the third treatment uh again not my intent uh you know and not my focus but if the patient gets benefit more power to them uh long-term strategy is to have patients uh, have uh, maintenance treatments at least every six months some patients want it every three months uh and uh there's no harm in doing it and uh if patients uh, or so inclined that I usually will comply unless there's a reason not to. Uh, and uh, so what ends up happening is not only do you have patients who are effectively treated with it, but you've also created an ongoing uh, source of revenue as these patients continue to come back filling your office uh, with uh, ongoing treatments. Uh, by far, from a, a practice management dollars and cents perspective, uh, the best investment uh, we've ever made uh, in any equipment. Now, I can argue, you know, and you can argue that OCT, uh, you know, was a great investment, not from a financial point of view, but from a practice and patient management point of view, 100%, I agree. You know, we have a lot of equipment we love, but in terms of financial rewards and patient satisfaction, nothing even comes close to this. Uh, so, that's my story uh, in terms of re return on investment. You know, this is typical. I mean, <laughs> look at the numbers. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, and and we're talking, I'm doing um, a lot more than four patients per week. So the impact on our practice has been overwhelming um, in the most positive of ways. I mean, uh, and, and those of you who know me know I say, like I said before, exactly what I think and exactly what I say. This is, you know, exactly what we're seeing. I mean, exactly what we're seeing. Uh, I don't think we can. In fact, I, you know, some of my, my friends who are on the board want to see if we can't push for aesthetics. I don't see the point of poking an angry bear. Uh, I'm happy just to be doing dry eye. It's been very, very, uh, you know, financially rewarding. Uh, but more importantly for patients, it's been you know, game changing. Uh, and, you know, I kind of alluded to this before. Luminous has been a phenomenal partner. Uh, my rep has just been incredible. You know, he comes by, you know, almost whenever, you know, we, we, we in fact, more than we even want him, you know, he comes by. Not in a bad way, but just to check in, you know, we, they're, they're very relationship focused. Uh, you know, I've gotten involved. I've helped other colleagues, you know, embrace this technology. Uh, and I've, by the same token, I've had uh, a lot that I've learned from other colleagues because of uh, Luminous uh, setting up uh, uh, opportunities to learn, you know, from each other. Uh, you get a marketing kit. Uh, it, it becomes, you know, very, very easy, very straightforward and simple. So I guess we can open it up for any questions. Uh, and I hope this was valuable. Um, and I appreciate all of you uh, hanging in here and Luminous for uh, putting this together. Thank you, uh, Dr. Epstein, uh, much appreciated. Uh, what I would suggest is I would read the questions and uh, you can address them. So I'll just put them one by one. We have already a few questions. The first one is what happens to inflammation on a cellular level with light therapy elevates the inflammation? No, I, I, the last part of it was broken up. What happens with inflammation and then? What happens to inflammation on a cellular level with light therapy that elevates the inflammation? That elevates the inflammation. Um, I, what, well, basically you have to go, I think you have to go to the dermatologic literature and this apparently modulates some of the underlying elements uh, that promote inflammation. So, I mean, if you look at it from uh, you know, from a dermatologic perspective with rosacea, you see a definite decrease uh, in those angry red vessels. Uh, part of it is probably sterilization. You're getting rid of a lot of either the demodex or the staph that are uh, suspected as cause, uh, you know, causative. Uh, in the eye, you're doing similar. You're getting rid of uh, a lot of the obstruction, you're increasing gland activity, uh, you're uh, decreasing the thickness uh, and uh, the saturation of the mybum, uh, you are getting rid of staph on the lids, uh, you, know, stay, you know, inflammation begets inflammation. So what you're doing is you're down-regulating inflammation uh, in a number of different ways that work in a coordinated fashion. I, I, I think a lot of the underlying science is there, but even more still isn't clearly apparent. There's a lot more going on uh, from this than you know we fully understand, but that's not unusual uh, in most areas uh, of clinical practice. 
Perfect, thank you. Next question is, have you looked at the efficacy of ILUX for the, for the post IPL expression? Uh, actually, you know, yes, I, I, tend, I tend not to do them at the at the same exact time, although I have thought of it. ILUX in particular uh, would be, uh, you know, probably the best instrument for that, simply because you're literally going to have it sitting on the side and then do it after. But, you know, for me, I find that, um, and again, this hasn't been widely reported and it doesn't occur in every patient, but the level of saturation of the lipid seems to decrease so dramatically in many of the patients that on manual you know, diagnostic expression, just basically light expression, you can see this clear lipid bubbling out of the glands after IPL treatment. Uh, I think normal blinking is effective at emptying the glands. I do uh, expression in patients that still have obstruction typically afterwards. In some patients, I've done IPL after doing uh, expression you know, uh, technology, but uh, you can incorporate the two. It's not a bad idea, but then you, it gets into pricing and you know, having to address patient issues. So sometimes separating things can just make your life a little bit easier in terms of uh, you know, the financial aspects of it. But from a technical point of view, it's not a bad idea at all. Okay. Why not uh, as successful in dark skin patients? Oh, um, we have a uh, absolutely amazing front desk person uh, who happens to be black and fairly dark uh, black. Uh, and uh, she saw what was happening with patients. She's great. In fact, sometimes she clues me into things clinically that I would otherwise miss. And she's not very clinical, uh, but she's very patient uh, connected, very uh, uh, patient uh, centric uh, in, in, in her focus. And after she saw all these happy patients leaving, she came, she said, you know, hey, doc, I want you to you know, set me up for that IPL. And I said, I said, Angelina, I, I can't. And uh, she said, well, I know, I know, I, you know, I really want it. These patients are doing so well. I said, Angelina, I, I just can't do IPL on you. And she goes, how come? I said, well, she said, because I'm black. And I said, yes. And she said, are you discriminating against me? I said, no, I'm, I'm protecting you. Because essentially, uh, the amount of energy that's absorbed, I mean, think about it for a second. Um, you know, if you ever visit Arizona and you have uh, get the misfortune of renting a black car, sit in that black car with the air conditioning off for about 30 seconds in the summer, and you'll discover exactly what I'm talking about. Black absorbs an incredible amount of energy, and that translates into heat. Uh, white, on the other hand, you could sit there probably for about five minutes before you die. So, uh, you know, so the, the darker the skin, the less the fluence, uh, and that's compensated for in the algorithms used to control the amount of energy delivered. Uh, but uh, you, when you get to a certain point, uh, a fits for you know, certainly a fits five, fits four you can treat carefully. Fits five is outside my comfort limits. And then when you're talking about really dark skinned people, you're talking about even higher levels. And I think it, it would probably be uh, too uh, dangerous uh, to, to attempt. Thank you. Uh, how often, so beyond the one year mark, how often are you repeating the procedure on well-maintained patients? Well, we're recommending every six months um, simply because the patients are doing so well and I don't want to lose it. But we're also very um, data driven. So patients are coming back every six months for uh, follow up typically. You know, sometimes I'll let a patient go for an entire year if they're really stable. Uh, but patients come back and get a complete workup every six months typically. And if a patient is doing great and has no symptoms and no problems, uh, I'll go a year uh, before recommending a retreatment. But I don't really want to go uh, beyond that because, uh, uh, you know, again, the patients have had so much benefit. And these are typically patients that weren't doing well that have done much better after IPL treatment. And I think they are very, um, you know, aware of that. So they want to uh, continue uh, you know, make, make make sure they don't backslide at all. So every six months for the average patient, no more than uh, once a year. Perfect. Uh, have you seen a decrease in the telangiectasia, sorry, of the lead margins? Yes, definitely. Um, in fact, uh, you see the same thing on, on their cheeks. You see the dermatologic improvements in some of these patients. You know, again, collateral improvement, you know, not my 
uh, focus, but you can see significant reduction in uh, telangiectatic vessels. And the lid margins just look so much healthier. I mean, it's 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 dramatic stuff. A lot, a lot of uh, colleagues when starting out, I think are confused how by treating the, uh, uh, the the cheeks, you know, basically using the Toyos protocol. How does that uh, make a difference in the glands and the and the in the skin of the lids? Uh, but the light propagates up, it, it, it you know propagates on a plane up into that area very very effectively. And, you know, it's very sensitive tissue, so it works well. Uh, we're seeing the beginnings of uh, treating the eyelids themselves using laser grade shields, uh, and I think that's the next frontier where we can probably we use a little bit less energy and be more direct in our treatment. But, uh, you know, we'll have to see how that, that goes. But definitely significant improvement in uh, decreased uh, telangiectatic vessels. Perfect. Next question. Sorry. Uh, your typical charge or the average charge per treatment. So, um, you know, I, you have to be careful, but I would say, I would say, I'll give you averages in in uh, the Phoenix metro area. So, and in fact, that's what I did when I uh, decided on pricing. Uh, I don't want a restraint of trade, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, FTC coming after me after the, uh, uh, after the, uh, F, uh, what is it, who just gave us our EIDL, uh, whatever, or some of it anyway. Um, so the typical uh, fee for uh, IPL is uh, anywhere from 375 to 450 per treatment. So let's take the high side. Uh, if you were charging the patient per treatment, the high side would be $1,800. So you have to look at the overall cost of the equipment, the amortization and things like that. So I would think uh, a charge of uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,400 uh, for four treatments would be reasonable in most areas, higher in some, lower. No, I wouldn't go lower. I think uh, a 1,000 would probably be, you know, probably a base um, treatment uh, cost. And patients are fine uh, typically paying up front in order to get the discount. Everybody loves a discount. Great. How soon do patients see results and feel better? Um, I would say um, 50 to 60 percent of patients will see significant improvement by when they return, uh, certainly by the th for the third visit. I would say 90 percent of patients will see significant results by the time uh, they return for, or I'd say 85% by the time they return for the fourth treatment, uh, and then another 5% will uh, get uh, improvement on the, after the fifth treatment, if they need the fifth. And as I mentioned before, I will throw in a fifth if I'm, I feel we just haven't made the progress. I want that, again, the outcomes focus more than you know, financial, so it's a, you know, do the right thing for the patient approach. Uh, so, uh, and the patients who do well early on, you know, the patient, there are some patients that come back for the second treatment and are already feeling significant improvement, but the patients who are showing improvement by the second, third uh, treatments are, are usually doing insanely well uh, and, you know, li life-changingly well, and they come in and they just make your day. I mean, they're the happiest people in your office. Great. Uh... Do you start the dry eye treatment with IPL from the beginning of the disease instead of using other treatments of treatment options? I always start, every patient gets foundational treatment, you know, and I, I alluded to that before. So um, every patient um, would get uh, a triglyceride-based omega-3. We use PRN, D3 now, but you could use uh, Nordic Naturals, uh, EPA Extra. Those are the two that I think uh, meet you know, my criteria. Uh, I use high clear hypochlorous acid and, you know, I use a warm heat mask. I use an eye eco derm. Uh, you know, there, there are a number of things that I typically do. Uh, we can't schedule IPL in the middle of a day would be too disruptive. Although my young associate, you know, his schedule is lighter than mine. So he can Oh, usually why than mine, sometimes not. It's getting pretty busy. Uh, but, you know, he sometimes will do a quick IPL in the middle of a day. And sometimes I'll do one too, if we can. But I much prefer to schedule them on IPL day. You know, IPL day for me is Friday. Uh, and we'll do one after the other after the other. So, um, um, 
and actually I forgot what the original question was. I hope I answered it. <laughs> yeah, I think you did. Uh, how long do you have uh, the patient not something before uh, the treatment? Now, I'm sorry, the dog was moving and made too much noise. How long do I have the patient? Not something before uh, doing the treatment. Uh, not, I missed the, the, that not before doing something. the treatment. Not going, going, not going to the sun, not being something. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's uh, okay. you were breaking up a little bit. Uh, I actually, if a patient is consistent, in other words, if the patient, let's say the patient is a constant golfer and goes and plays golf like every single week and they're stable, uh, then I will, unless they're like, you can see that they're burned or, you know, overly suntanned um, and, uh, you know, they tell you that uh, if they don't, if they, if they're not, if they're not outside of their normal consistent skin tone, I'll generally treat them. Uh, we had a patient that was using artificial, uh, you know, the uh, skin tanner and I had set up an appointment. She really needed it bad, horrible rosacea, horrible acne, horrible meibomian gland dysfunction, almost no glands left, uh, had, uh, uh, she had taken uh, Accutane. I mean, just literally a poster child. And she came back and, she, and I don't know what the heck she used, but I mean, I b barely did, recognized her. And she came in, she said, I'm here for my first IPL treatment. I said, no, you're not. Uh, you know, let, let that stuff wear off. So she came back a month later and was back to her normal skin tone. Uh, so you do need some consistency be before you do it. And by the way, I remember the original question, the answer to the question is everybody starts uh, with a foundational treatment. We don't do, uh, we wouldn't do IPL on the same day they come for a dry eye workup. It would be on a follow-up treatment. That's two answers for one. Perfect. And actually a kind of a follow-up question. Uh, so do you, you know, protect, uh, do you have some blocking of the skin? Uh, there are some skin spots. Uh, okay, you're bringing up a little bit. Say again, do I no. do? In case of skin spots, do you use some blocking on the skin? Um, well, actually, we do we 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 do sun blocking after the treatment. Uh, you have to be careful. There's a condition called melasma, and melasma, and you, you probably have seen it. It's it's like a dark patch, uh, you know, well circumscribed. Uh, it's not uh, like a nevus, it's not raised, it's just part of the skin. That does not do well with IPL. I mean, there's some dermatologists treat it, uh, you know, with certain wavelengths of IPL, but it's not an optometric uh, or an ophthalmologic approach. It really is a dermatologic or a, maybe even a plastics person's approach. So for those patients, I avoid melasma, areas of melasma. Uh, some people use a white eyeliner, uh, to cover uh, areas that you don't want to treat, which we uh, have done once. Uh, I typically don't have to. I can just usually avoid it. The uh, uh, the tip of the uh, of the M22 is is maneuverable enough to be able to spot treat exactly where you want. Uh, but uh, yeah, you you do want to avoid abnormal areas. Aging spots are fine. You can you know that's no 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 problem at all. I would recommend that you uh, consult an atlas of dermatology before you start doing this, just to familiarize yourself with different skin lesions. I think it will improve your confidence. Uh, and uh, expand your horizons. Perfect. We have now a Shalazia question. So do you treat Shalazia? Uh, actually, we're waiting for uh, the Shalasia. We're all set up. You know, it's it's like all we're all dressed up. We have our uh, we have our uh, uh, you know our tie. We have our uh, shirt. We have our tuxedo. Uh, you know, we're just waiting for the for the right patient. In fact, that we had a patient uh, last week, but unfortunately, we're you know I try I had to try doxycycline first. It was a, an old patient. You know, not an old patient. He actually is an old patient, but is a you know one of my you know close patients. So I said, if this doesn't work, I'll come in and we'll do a uh, uh, we'll do an IPL. Laura Perriman has uh, evolved the technique uh, and using laser grade shields to protect uh, the ocular surface and using the small tip on the uh, on the m22 and uh, it, it from all the results I've seen has worked really well we just haven't had the right patient at the right time but we're all set up and looking forward to doing it in fact my young associate is like you know champing at the bit he wants to go uh, to do it so it's, it's something we definitely will be doing uh, so let's take one final question, and we, we have tons of questions. So sorry for those uh, we haven't 
had their questions answered, reach out to us after uh, uh, the call, and we would be happy to uh, uh, to get your uh, your answers. Uh, one last, I would say, price question: Do you bundle uh, the treatments, or you charge per procedure? What are your thoughts? So, so I bundle uh, the initial treatment, so it's and, and paid up front, so the patient pays, you know, X amount for for treatments. And as I said, don't charge for the fifth. And for follow up treatments afterwards, we don't, we unbundle, so we charge the full per treatment amount for uh, the six month or the three month or you know whatever it is that we're we're doing. So uh, bundle treatments we bundle, uh, individual treatments we don't. Perfect. Uh, so I think by that we would thank uh, Dr. Epstein and thank you everyone for, for joining us. Again, feel free to reach out either to Dr. Epstein or to us uh, and we would be happy to answer more questions uh, and we will take it from uh, there. Thank you everyone uh, and have a nice day. Yep, thank you. Uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, art Epstein at Gmail and just uh, put luminous uh, in the subject header, you know, luminous question or something like that, uh, artepstein at gmail.com. Everyone be safe, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll all be back to work pretty soon. And again, thanks to Luminous for putting this on. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.